Our Father, we do bless your name because you brought us to the Bible story. Thank you, Lord, because of your spirit, explaining, expounding, applying the word to every heart, every time we come. We're asking, O oh Lord, that tonight you reach out to every soul and every spirit in Jesus' name. We're asking that the light of your word will shine in every heart in Jesus' name. And that, Lord, this passage we read will reach everyone, touch everyone. And through the power in your word, you turn us around in Jesus' name. We we'll pray, Lord, that you use this and all the other studies we're hearing to prepare us for a better, a good eternity in Jesus' name. We pray that whatever you need to correct and chisel out of our lives, we pray, Lord, in your own gracious way, you do it in Jesus' name. We pray that no stain and no defilement and no evil will remain in any heart as we look at your word and then we apply this word into our hearts. Your word that we kept in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Help us, Lord, that through this word, you'll preserve and protect your people individually and corporately from evil in this generation in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, open our eyes to see what you are telling us and what you are teaching us to see. Amen. That our lives will be richer and better, higher in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. It's actually a long chapter, but it's uh, mostly narrative. That means it tells a lot of stories as to this happened and that happened. And then we're going to glean out and take out principles out of the Word of God. And I pray that the teaching of the Word tonight will enrich every soul in Jesus' name. I'm going to select some verses to read to start with so that you get a feel of what is happening here. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. I read chapter 5. I read from verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. That's how the chapter begins. And actually, when they sold that possession, they had seen what the others had done. And because of the encouragement of what others have done, a great revival taking place, a revival of love, of fellowship, of unity in the church. And people coming and surrendering everything that they had for the glory of God and for the use of the people of God so that there will be no lack in the house of the living God. They too, and as a sapphira, they decided it's good we do this as well so that we'll be able to follow what other people are doing. Let me just show you the example antecedent to this. That is before this in chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 35. Chapter 4, verse 35. It says, they laid down, laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as the arch need. Other people were coming. And they just sold everything. They gave their hearts to the Lord to start with. And then they gave their possessions to the Lord. And now we have a particular person. We're thinking, we're looking at verse 36 and Joseph, who by the apostles was so named Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So that's what was going on at that time. And because of that, this couple, a family, decided they were going to do the same thing. But they were not transparent. They were not truthful. They were not faithful. They were not loyal. They were not fully committed. They were not fully surrendered unto the Lord. And eventually something happened to them. We'll read about that later. But look at verse 11. It says in verse 11, And great fear came upon all the church. And upon as many as heard these things, the judgment of God came on sin. And as a result of that judgment, there was fear with the people. But the Lord was in the divine purging process. He wanted to keep the early church pure, the early church holy, the early church clean, the early church undefiled, so that the growth and the revival that was in their midst will continue. That's why we're tackling uh, the passage today as divine purging for preservation and spiritual progress. But in spite of the things that happened and the fear that came upon all the church, look at verse 12 now, it says, And by the hand of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought 
among the people and they were all with one accord in solomon's porch and that means that the devil's intention had been totally destroyed because jesus christ was given so that he would destroy all the works of the devil he wanted to bring disunity wanted to bring corruption wanted to bring defilement wanted to bring a kind of deception into the church and the Lord took care of that and it says the revival continued it tells us in verse 16 in verse 16 and there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits and they were healed everyone the power remained of them once there's purging and there's righteousness and holiness and a sanctified kind of life and a kind of fellowship that is pure and holy and sanctified the power of god will continue and i pray that in this revival the lord is bringing us to i pray that this revival will continue in jesus name but God will have to purge us individually and purge our families and purge our local churches and purge our leadership and purge our membership. And when the purging is there and the holiness is there, the righteousness is there, the sanctification is there, then the fire of revival, pure and flowing, will continue. It will continue in Jesus' name. And then eventually, because of the great things that were happening, Persecution rose up. It was a kind of local persecution. The, the Pharisees and Sadducees and members of the Sanhedrin, that is the council, a kind of council, church council, they were not happy. Um, or should I say synagogue council, not church? They were not happy. They laid hold on these apostles and put them in the prison. But the Lord brought them out. The Lord will bring you out. Look at verse 19. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life that is uh, their courage was restored and the angel said don't let anything silence you the power of god is moving and the preaching of the gospel must continue and so they continued and a lot of people see came to know the lord look at the final verse of this chapter it says and daily every day in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and to preach jesus christ they were not silenced that time we are not going to be silenced this time God remains the same. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Holy Ghost is still the same. And the power of the Holy Ghost is still the same. And the gifts of the Spirit, they are still the same. And we believers are still the same. The Bible remains the same. And with all this weapon in our hands, we're going to succeed in Jesus' name. As I've read to you now in the last, in the previous chapter, we learned of the examples of consecration, example of unity, example of fellowship, example of spirituality, piety, love, and heavenly mindedness of the Christians in the early church. They surrendered their hearts to Christ wholeheartedly without any reservation. And they were willing to give up their possession to provide for the needs of others. Their lives and possessions belong to the Lord. They understood what we mean by divine ownership, that God owns them, owns their body, owns their soul, owns their spirit. And because of that, he also owns whatever it is they have got in this world, their certificates or their talents or their skill or their ability or whatever they are able to raise up, that everything belongs to God. And because it belongs to God, it belongs to the body of Christ. Each believer then recognizes divine ownership. And so was really available body, soul, and spirit available, time, talent, and treasure available, mind, will, and skill available, house, household, and heritage, all available for his glory and for his service. Although Barnabas, I read that to you already, was specifically mentioned, many other people, many other believers demonstrated the same kind of single-mindedness and the same kind of sacrificial love toward God and toward the church. In fact, as we really look at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, you see that this began as those 3,000 people were born again and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine, rejoicing and studying and praying together in fellowship. You'll find that it was since that time, this kind of communal living and contribution and just giving everything they had had started. We're looking at chapter 2 verse 44, and all that believed were together and laid all and had all things common and sold 
took their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Come to chapter 4. In chapter 4, we're reading from verse 32 so that you'll see that this was an ongoing sin in the early church because of the great love that the Lord had put in their hearts. Chapter 4, verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And then he goes on in verse 34, it says, neither was there any among them that lack. There will be no lack in our midst. You were there yesterday. Were you there yesterday? Of course you were there. There's no loss and there's no lack. And tell me the rest. And there's no limitation to come upon your life in Jesus' name. If it happened in the early church, it's going to happen in the church of today. That all our needs will be supplied. As God pours down the rain from heaven and then we too horizontally, it's coming vertically and then horizontally, we're reaching out to each other. Every need of our lives will be supplied in Jesus' name. And neither was there any among them that lagged. For as many as were possessors of lands and or houses sold them and brought the prices to of the things they sold to the apostle feet, he said they laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto what's the next word there? Tell me out loud, unto every man, every man yours will come to you according as he had need. And so that was what happened at that time. Yet we need to understand this, that nobody was compelled to sell anything. Nobody was compelled to surrender their property. The apostles did not lay down any rule and neither did they set out a new doctrine so that, you know, these that continue now were want to set down this, everybody must do this. No, that's why as we come to chapter 5 and verse 4, uh, Peter told Anas and us and said, who forced you to do this? You don't have to deceive. You don't have to uh, kind of be hypocritical. He said in verse 4, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this sin in thine heart? It wasn't necessary. Or well, say it was superfluous. You know, there are some people that do something wrong and the, the sin they are doing is not even necessary. The sin they are committing is not necessary. There is no compulsion. The devil is not even pushing them or driving them or pouncing on them or forcing them to do anything. And they, they just do it when it is unnecessary. And so Peter said, this is unnecessary. Why have you done something like this? And in fact, uh, this uh, practice did not long continue in the early church because now when eventually needs arose in the Jerusalem church, special offerings were collected for them. Now during this period of spontaneous, extraordinary experience, all things were done without compulsion. Notice that, without hypocrisy. Number three, without praise seeking. Number four, without lying, without carnal comparison and without self-centered comparison. There was true revival, heaven sent revival, and spirit inspired revival. But then something happened. Like Achan, in the early days of Israel's entry into the land of promise, Ananas and Sapphira, they came with subtlety, and they came with hypocrisy and iniquity to introduce sin and evil into the spirit filled and spirit controlled and spirit inspired a church. But God immediately arrested that situation. And the supernatural, soul winning revival, soul saving revival continued. And that's what we have read in chapter 5. Look at that again, chapter 5, and verse 42. And it says, And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. We're going to go in depth now as we look at the chapter. We've divided the chapter into three parts. Number one, divine displeasure against sin. Divine displeasure against sin. You will see from what happens the nature of God. God is a holy God. And because God is a holy God, he hates sin. And he deals with sin if sin is not repented of. And Ananas and Sapphira had a chance to repent, but he did not repent. And because of that judgment came, I pray that God will help us. We'll escape the judgment of God in Jesus' name. Number two is documented demonstrations of supernatural signs. Documented demonstrations of supernatural signs. Those signs, supernatural signs, signs and waters took place at that time and is taking place at this time. 
It was documented. Yours will be documented. What if your name gets some paper that you are the one, you got this miracle and you got that miracle, and then your testimony is encouraging many other people that if God can do that for that brother there, that sister there, he'll do my own. You'll be an encouragement to other people in Jesus' name. And then point number three is decisive dedication to soul winning. Whatever happened to Anna Sapphira, did it allow that to hinder them? The work of God continued. And whatever has happened to uh, so one Achan somewhere, another Korah, Dathan, Abiram in another place, whatever has happened to Judas is carried somewhere, it's not going to affect your zeal. It will not affect your passion for souls. It will not affect your drive to want other people to get saved and you'll go from strength to strength in the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. Let's come back to number one. Number one is divine displeasure against sin. I'm reading now from chapter 5 and reading from verse 1. It says, But a certain man named Ananias, who Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the prize. His wife also being privy to it. That is, privately, they discussed this and decided this and he is, this is going to be secret. This is a covenant, husband and wife covenant. What I say is what you say. What, what you feel is what I feel. And the plan, we're having the plan together. And privately, without anybody knowing. But how can we hide anything from God? Can we hide from God? How can we hide anything from the Holy Ghost? Can we hide anything from the Holy Ghost? Although Peter may not be there, Paul may not be there, although James or John may not be there, although the other members and ministers may not be there, God is there. He's a silent listener to every conversation. And he's the quiet observer to every situation happening, wherever you are, behind closed doors or in the dark or in the night. And then you decide, this is what you are going to do. He knows it all. Where can you go that the hand of the Lord will not reach you? Or that the eyes of the Lord will not see you? His eyes run to and fro all over the world. And he sees what is happening. And so he says so privately, they did this. And then it says they came now to lay everything the apostles' feet come, come to verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie unto the Holy Ghost? It says, You are telling a lie. And you know, uh, Peter did not have to do some interrogation and some interview and some investigation. When the Holy Ghost is there, when the Holy Ghost is present, there will be revelation. And I pray that the Holy Ghost will be mightily present and prominent in our midst in Jesus' name. So that all those hypocrites and all those deceivers, God will fish them out in Jesus' name. If you are not a hypocrite, give me a good amen. And then it says in verse, in, verse, in verse 4, it says to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this sin in thine heart? Listen to this. Thou hast not lied unto men, but tell me unto God. You know, in verse 3 it says you have lied to the Holy Ghost. Now in verse 4 it says you have lied to God. That means the Holy Ghost is God. God the Father, he is God. The Son, Jesus Christ, he is God. And the Holy Ghost too is God. That's why we have the triune God. That's why we have the Trinity. It goes on in verse 5. It's saying, Ananas hearing these words fell down and gave up the ghost and great fear came on all them that had these. It goes on in verse 6. It says, and the young men arose and wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. You know, there are some people, no matter who they see and no matter who is talking to them, she didn't recognize that this, you know, it was at the time of this early church, great miracles happening, signs and wonders happening. And then the gifts of the Spirit were in display. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and the discerning of spirits, and the gift of faith, and the gift of walking miracles, and the gifts of healing, and the gifts of prophecy, and the gifts of speaking in tongues and interpretation. Everything was there in the early church. And 
these people not understanding that it is not only when we come to prayer meeting that the gifts are in operation that even when Peter was alone without any chorus being sung and without any kind of worship being put in place that the gifts were, were in operation and so she came in three hours later not knowing what had happened to the husband what happened to the husband tell me he died he died under the judgment of God did he go to heaven or went to the other side he went to the other side. You know, some people, we don't know the last opportunity you are going to have before the trumpet or some before that the judgment, the hand of God will come upon you. That's why it's not good to play with sin or play with evil of any shape at any time. And so it says, when she came, the apostle said, is it for so much? She said, of course, for so much. Because of this covenant, they arch together. And then he goes on to say, and Peter answered unto her, tell me, whether ye sold it for so much? And she said, yea, for so much. And then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together? Agreed together. Agreed together. There are some people that feel that husband and wife, you must always agree. If the husband says, let's backslide, you must agree. If the husband says, we must tell a lie to the church, you must agree. If the husband says, we must steal from the church, you must agree. Because husband and wife, they are one. Because uh, two shall come together and then it shall be one flesh. Not one in sin. Not one on the way to hell. Not one in evil. Not one in hypocrisy. Not one in deception, but one in righteousness. And one is serving the Lord. And one in obeying the Lord. And one on our way to heaven. Not one on our way to hell. If your husband wants to go to hell eh, for the sake of unity, will you agree? You want to go to hell because your husband says, that's the way I'm going and we're united. We have to be united and go to hell. Would that be all right? That will be all wrong. That's when it comes to sin. That's when separation comes. And then you say, no, I cannot go that far. And then Peter the apostle said, how is it that she have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young man came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And says, and great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as had these things. Well, as you look at the Bible, you'll find that, uh, you know, this uh, gate was in operation also in the lives of, uh, of uh, prophets in the Old Testament. When people did evil and they tried to cover up, the, the Spirit of God revealed to those great leaders and those, uh, and those prophets and revealed everything. Look at Second Kings chapter 5. In 2 Kings chapter 5, what he did about Gehazi here, and you'll see what happened unto him. I read him from verse 20. It says, But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has, has, has speared Naaman, the Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that, that which he brought, but as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is it is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me. True or false? I said, True or false? My master has sent me. The master did not send him, did not send him. He just went saying, Behold, even now they have become to me from Mount Ephraim, two young men of the sons of the prophets. I give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, Be content to take two talents. And he urged him and bound the two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bared them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house and he let the men go and they departed. And when and he went in and stood before his master. 
as if nothing had happened. There are some people, no matter what lies they tell, they just, uh, you know, make their faces uh, normal. And then they stand the way they were standing, and they look the way they were looking, and you will not detect anything except you have the Spirit of God. And if you go by investigation, interrogation, and query, and this and that, you never discover the truth. If you use your common sense or, you know, your experience or whatever, you never discover. Because they are perfected lying, and they are perfected deception, and they are perfected hypocrisy that you can never tell. But when we have the Spirit of God, all those things they have done, the Lord will reveal them. And it's for the mercy of God, it's for the mercy of God when God reveals that so that they can repent before the judgment day. And I pray that if there's anything you're hiding that will get you into hell, God will reveal and expose everything so that the mercy of God will work on you and then you repent, you'll be on your way to heaven in Jesus' name. And it says in verse 20, in verse 25, Then he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? Oh, and he said, Thy servant went no whither. Is that right? Did he go somewhere? Of course, he went somewhere. And then he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? How I pray that leaders at this time, how I pray that those who say they are church leaders and they are church pastors, whoever they are, the Spirit of God will be upon us so much that we'll be able to help people and counsel aright and direct people so that they will not destroy themselves before their time and so that you'll be able to help them to come out of that deception and come out of that evil and that lying in Jesus' name. But you see, it says, this man said, I, I didn't go anywhere. And then the man of God said, is it a time to receive money? and to receive garments and olive yards and, and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and mid servants the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thee for how long? forever that man got something he wasn't bargaining for he thought it was the money and all the things that he got to spend them the and he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. He also lost his position as the son of the man of God. We're looking at the uh, first Kings chapter 14. First Kings chapter 14. And uh, there is a challenge for us who are leaders, for us to have the spirit of God. So that the Achans in the church and the Gehazites in the church and the Ananas and Sapphira in the church will not be able to deceive us. Because that kind of deception will make them to remain in their sins and then there will be no opportunity for them to repent and get to heaven. But God is raising leaders up so that we we'll help people to know that sin is sin. And then they repent. And when they repent, they will be on their way to heaven. I pray that you will get to heaven in Jesus' name. In First Kings chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 6, and it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam, why, fin why finish thou thyself? Why are you disguising yourself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. You see, the husband Jeroboam had told the wife, He said, Go to uh, this man, Ahijah the prophet, but pretend to disguise yourself. Don't act like you are, don't dress like you are my wife because, you know, when she insists you that she are my wife, because of the evil I have done, he might just begin to prophesy negative things against this child and this child might die. So disguise yourself. And the Lord told the prophet before the wife of Jeroboam came in uh, that she, this woman is coming and she's going to disguise herself. She's going to act like another woman, dress like another woman, look like another woman. It's all deception. You see, there are people who deceive. You don't have to open your mouth to tell a lie before you deceive. You can dress and deceive. You can keep correct and deceive. You can, you know, squeeze your face or whatever and pretend as if nothing is happening and deceive. We can deceive by action. Body language can become like deception. The things you refuse to say can be like deception. And the things you say, the things you do can be like deception. But deception, whatever it is, whether it is acted out or spoken out or it's just quiet, the Lord knows everything. 
And I pray that God will grant us transparent righteousness and holiness with everyone in the church in Jesus' name. And then it says in verse 7, Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel and you know, it goes on and then it now lays the judgment upon them. And I pray that the gifts of the Spirit will be abundant in our church. Eventually, the, the judgment came and I pray that we will escape the judgment of God. We're looking at Second Peter, Second Peter, we're looking at it from verse 20. When people have come to know the Lord in great revivals like this, people are born again. The children of God, they have turned around and their sins have been forgiven. And then we're walking on the path of right righteousness that leads to heaven day by day the grace of god can be in our lives and we can live victorious we will be victorious we can live above sin we'll be above sin in jesus name but you see there are people that become careless and then they go back to their vomit if they were lying before they go back to their line if they were you know chatter at people dramatize before they not begin to dramatize and they begin to disguise and begin to do this or that and then they go back to their old vomit i pray that will not happen to you second peter chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 20 it says for if after they have escaped the corruption the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the lord and and savior jesus christ if they are again entangled therein you escape lying in the past you are again entangled in lying you escaped uh, hypocrisy before then you escape if you, you you then go back into that hypocrisy again you escaped uh, you know a kind of immoral life before then you go back again and you're entangled then it says and overcome the latter end is worse of them than the beginning for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his vomit again and the soul, that is the pig that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. I pray that will not happen to us. But the judgment of God is there. And because we fear the judgment of God, that's why you want to. If that has crept back into your life, you want to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. While the day of grace still lasts, why there is still mercy, why the love of God is still calling you, then you repent of that thing. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 9. It says in chapter 5 verse 9, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It was uh, something that uh, the sin of Anna and Sapphira, they were, it was discovered at that time. What if it wasn't discovered? It will follow them to the day of judgment because the day will come, day of reckoning, day of judgment, when we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone, no exception, everyone may receive the things done in, the body, in his body according to that he has done, whether they be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your, in your consciences. I pray the Lord will give us wisdom and will live right in Jesus' name. The chapter you look at your nose opens with a shocking exposure of a member's hypocrisy, a member's insincerity, a member's deception, and hellish iniquity. And Ananias' hypocrisy consisted of imitating God's people, godly people. And it consisted of lying and deception to win the praise of men. They'll praise me for this. I'll be one of the good, good people, one of the great people in this church. They will know that, like Barnabas, what he has done, I'm doing that too. He was looking for cheap praise, uh, for cheap uh, kind of commendation, applause of men. He had a form of godliness appearing to be righteous while hiding a terrible sin 
see in the heart. His sin or pretense was to present himself to men that he was righteous and then gain position and gain recognition in the church as a consecrated, devoted, spiritual and faithful disciple. While professing to give all to God, he secretly kept back a part of what he professed to, to have given. Is that was filled with, by Satan, by deception. And while his mouth proclaimed exceptional devotion unto the Lord, and his wife agreed with him to keep their sin against God, their sin against the church, secret. I hope you don't misunderstand, uh, you know, the teaching of the word of God on marriage. You know, sometimes uh, there are some people that will take a verse of scripture. Husband and wife united. Husband and wife loving. Husband and wife always in agreement. And they do not make a distinction between in agreement and righteousness. And then when it comes to righteousness, we disagree. We are in agreement in godliness. When it comes to worldliness, we must disagree. And we are in agreement on our way to heaven. When it comes to somebody is making a choice to go to hell, we must disagree. We must be able to differentiate between evil and good good and evil and as but safari did not understand that safari just felt we're married we're married and if we're going the left hand side we all go together we're going to right we all go together if my husband you know dreams out and cops out this kind of policy and principle that this is what we're going to do we're going to do it together i pray that you sisters will be wise in jesus name wise unto salvation wise unto sanctification wise unto holiness wise unto righteousness wise unto godliness so that you will live a righteous life whatever your husband decides to do you got you are born into this world all by yourself alone you didn't meet that man when you were born into this world when you were born again you didn't know that man you came to know the lord because you want to go to the kingdom of god you want to go to heaven and it was later you met together even if you were married when you got converted it was still an individual decision and i pray that your holiness and righteousness will still remain personal and individual in jesus name but then let, let me come to the apostle now the secret was revealed to the apostle peter the word of knowledge descend on spirits and word of wisdom and the gifts of the spirit were in operation and sinners could not hide before the spirit filled apostles in the early church where the spirit of the lord is there, there will be revelation inspiration and power and then swift judgment came on these unrepentant sinners who were determined to hinder and stop the soul saving revival in the early church god quickly purged his church and to preserve her, to preserve the church in purity and power. But I need to make a, one our leaders here. You know, sometimes people do not know, they do not know the difference between word of knowledge and suspicion. There are some people that just suspect. And because of that suspicion, they think that this one has done wrong. And, and they're very strong about that. We must uh, understand that this was not suspicion on the side of Peter. And this is not imagination. There are some people that have keen imagination. And they think that you know, they imagine to see a brother. And they imagine it may be as well. Maybe as done that must be very careful. And this is not natural intuition. Some people say, I feel it. I feel that this man is not living right. I feel that this woman is not living right. It is not natural in instinct either. It's not like, you know, you distrust somebody because you distrust people. And then out of that distrust, a kind of a suggestion is coming in your mind. This is not, this is the gift of the spirit. And this is not assumption. I assume. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to tell you, I'm assuming that he's not living right. This is not assumption. This is not guessing seen he didn't guess that Shino and us had done something wrong there are some leaders church leaders or pastors they are guessing they're assuming they're they are kind of supposing they're imagining that somebody has done something wrong because they distrusted that person before and because of that distrust they're bringing up this and it is not supposition either you see when we do that when you are as a christian leader you are you know suspecting and you are imagining as a christian leader you are so suspecting members of the church or you are suspecting workers in the church you are going to do evil yourself look at ezekiel chapter 13 ezekiel chapter 13 and see the consequence of such suspicion 
assumption, distrust, and imagination, intuition, and all that, and then you are going to mislead people. It says in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 22, because with lies he have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. You know, if you go by imagination, you make a righteous people sad. They have not done anything wrong. You say, I know you've done something wrong. You are like Anas. You are like Achan. No, that's just suspicion. And that's just imagination. And that is distrust. Be very careful of that because it says with lies that you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. But on the other hand, look at this in the second part. And strengthen the hands of of the wicked, and he, and that he, return, he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. And there are some other people, uh, they say, well, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a dreamer, but uh, you know, sister so-and-so had a dream, and sister so-and-so said, according to her dream, this is who you are, you're a witch, you're a wizard, you're a this, you are, I know nothing about what you're talking about, no sister so-and-so said, according to her dream, this is who you are. If you're a pastor and you're leading the church by your own dream or other people's dreams, you're going to lead the church astray. And you're going to punish the wrong person. And then you might come under the judgment of God. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23, I'm reading from verse 25. I have heard what the prophet said. said. It says, the prophet said, lies in my name. said, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. And you know, it's unfortunate when we come to a church like this, a Bible-based church, a scripturally-based church, that now we're going after dreams. Somebody had a dream that so-and-so is that. So another person had a dream so-and-so is that. You are thinking about that. Already your imagination was very keen and sharp before you slept. Your suspicion was there. Your distrust was there. Your supposition was there. Your guesswork was there. And now you slept. And because of that supposition, that's why you are saying, I had a dream, so and so is that, and such and such is that. And the Lord is saying, I'm against all these prophets that prophesy lies in my name. I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets. Prophets of the deceit of their own heart. Imagination, deceit of their own heart. Supposition, deceit of their own heart. Intuition, deceit of their own heart. In verse 27, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers are forsaking my, my name by Bill. I pray God will deliver us from that in Jesus' name. But you see what the Lord did in that uh, in that in the early church, it was to purge the church so that the church will be purged and the church will be refined and the church will remain pure and holy and righteous and sanctified and heavenly minded and single minded so that they'll be on their way to heaven. Look at uh, Malachi chapter 3 verse 3. Malachi chapter 3 verse 3 and the purging process is still going on because the church still needs to be pure and holy and righteous and sanctified and transparent. In Malachi chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 3, it says, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. I pray that that refining without a judgment, without, a, you know, striking us, the refining of the Lord will continue in our midst in Jesus' name. We come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. We're looking at the second point now, documented demonstrations of supernatural signs. Documented demonstration of supernatural signs. I'm reading from verse 12. It says in chapter 5 verse 12, from by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Many signs and wonders. Can you say that with me? Many signs and wonders. Can you say that again? For the last time. That's what is going to keep on happening in Jesus' name. The Lord wants to visit his church and is visiting us. And I pray that the mighty hand of the Lord will continue with us in Jesus' name. Miracles of mercy, miracles of power, miracles of healing, miracles of deliverance, and miracles of making mountains move and wonderful. We're now getting to that next month, uh, June, when mountains move. And they are going to move. I said they are going to move. 
you know those like long standing problems when mountains move and at the time when rain is falling that's when to come in if you really want the refreshing of the lord at the time when the fire is burning that's when you need to come out and then it will heat up everything that is cold and at the time when mountains everywhere left right center back and front when mountains are moving that's when you need to block into the power of god every mountain in your life will move away in jesus name and then you tell your neighbors that don't be let out this is the day of revival mountains are moving and their mountains will move in jesus name signs and wonders wrought among the people and they were all with one accord in solomon's porch and he says of the rest does no man uh, join himself to them but the people magnify them and believers were the more added to the lord multitudes both of men and women you see the judgment that came upon Anas and sapphira did not hinder the revival soul saving uh, revival and heavenly saint heaven saint revival in the midst of the people still going on and i pray that that revival which has now started revival power as of old and power better than of all time will remain and continue in our midst in jesus name in fact it says in verse 15 is so much that they brought uh, forth the sick on into the streets and laid them on beds and couches and it says at the least that are the least the shadow of peter passing by might overshadow some of them and it says and there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto jerusalem bringing sick folks and them that were vexed and with unclean spirits and they were healed tell me the rest there everyone they were healed everyone these are days of miracles and as they come all of us will be healed in jesus name in fact a special miracles took place look at acts of the apostles chapter 19 acts chapter 19 i'm reading from verse 11 and from verse 12 verses 11 and 12 and god wrought special miracles by the hands of paul why are we reading that because our own time of special miracles have now arrived special miracles special miracles special miracles they are happening in jesus name so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and, and or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits were, were went out of them they were all cast out we're told in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. I'm reading here from verse 17. It says, And this sign shall follow them that believe. Will follow me. Will follow you. Will follow us in Jesus' name. And in my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take off serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And it says, and they went forth, and preach everywhere the Lord walking with them. He'll walk with you. He'll walk with our pastors. Walk with our overseers. Keep on walking with us as a church in Jesus' name. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. And then now we will come back to Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. And we're looking at uh, the result of that. Look at it in verse 17. And, and the high priest rose up. And all that, all they that were with him. Which is of the sect of uh, the Sadducees. And they were filled with, what word is there? Indignation. Indignation. Indignation that means wrath. That means anger. They were unhappy because of the miracle that had happened. It says, look at that again. They were filled with indignation. I, I think it's good for you to examine yourself so that you will see on what side you are. Are you on the side of the church or you're on the side of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin? When miracles take place, when something good has happened to a brother, something good has happened to a sister, and then God is answering prayer. Praise the Lord, this happened to me. Praise the Lord, see what I God, if you are part of the church and part of the group that actually follows the Lord, there will be joy in your heart. There will be peace in your heart. There will be appreciation in your heart. You say, praise the Lord for what is happening. 
says joy in the city joy and means in the midst of the people of god and that same joy will be in your heart but if you are on the side of the unbelievers and they're on the side of the the people that hate righteousness they are not partners in progress but they are partners in evil your heart will be filled with indignation in fact this is not a new thing you're going to find out that those uh, people sanhedrin sadducee pharisee religious people traditional people that has always been their attitude when a miracle takes place when a healing takes place when signs and wonders take place there's always this indignation and wrath and anger in their hearts let's come to luke chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 12. luke chapter 13 we're looking at verse 12. so you'll see that this uh, indignation it's like, um, you know, anger rested in their bosom. Anger rested in their heart. Look at chapter 13, verse 5 of Luke. It's the chapter 13 of Luke, verse 12. It says, when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. And what did she do? glorify God. And you'll glorify God with her. She's been sick for all those many years, 18 years and then all of a sudden the power of God came upon her and then she became straightened up and, and she glorified God. But look at verse 14 and the ruler of the synagogue answered with what? Indignation. Indignation. What made the woman happy gave, her, gave him anger. All the rulers there, they were angry. And if you are part of the people of God with all these great things happening, there will be joy in your heart. You will not have indignation or wrath or anger. Let's look at John chapter 7. I'm looking at it from verse 23. John chapter 7, verse 23. It says in verse 23, if a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, and but th that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry? Are ye angry? And I should ask you a question, are you angry? Are you angry? As a child of God, we should not be angry. We should not be angry at, you know, at anything that is good, anything that is of righteousness, anything that's a work of God. Miracles happening, signs and wonders happening, and uh, all these deliverances taking place, we should not be angry. It says, are you angry at me because I have made a man every which whole on the Sabbath day? In fact, uh, let's look at uh, what uh, the Old Testament of the Bible in the Old Testament has to say concerning anger. Anger of any shape and anger of any size in your life, in your heart. I pray that if you're an angry man, God will deliver you in Jesus' name. Angry woman, God will deliver you in Jesus' name. Indignation should not be something a part of the life of a child of God. Wrath should not be a part of the life of a child of God. Anger should not be a part of the life of a child of God. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 27, and I'm reading here in verse 4. Chapter 27, and in verse 4, it says, Wrath is cruel, and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? You see, the reason why those uh, Sadducees were angry and in, in dig indignant is because they couldn't do that. They were the leaders of religion and they were the leaders of tradition and the people will shift attention from these religious people and shift the attention to these apostles unlettered apostles but miracles taking place is because of that jealousy and envy they were filled with indignation and sometimes it's not a miracle it's, it's just like your brother is making progress your brother is you know getting line is uh, you know building a house, your brother is getting married, your, your sister is having a child, your sister, brother is having something you don't have, in answer to prayer, or in answer to their hard work, and then envy comes in, jealousy comes in, and the envy and the jealousy brings indignation, and brings anger, and brings wrath, that's the kind of anger that God condemns. I pray you'll be free from that in Jesus' name. In fact, he tells us in Proverbs chapter 22. Look at Proverbs chapter 22, and I'm reading from verse 24. Anger is so bad, it's so terrible that, you know, you shouldn't uh, have it. And if you have it, you should kind of segregate you somewhere, isolate you somewhere. Look at chapter 22, verse 24. Make no friendship with, tell me an angry man and with a furious man thou shalt not go make no friendship with an angry man 
you know, sometimes uh, you're in courtship and, uh, you know, sister, you see that the man, before we raise up one point, two points we are going to discuss, the man is angry already and you're still in courtship and, you know, the man cannot even still calm down and, you know, still show some love. Every time, anger, anger. And then you want to go with that man. Make no friendship. I almost said make no courtship, but, you know, I came to just this, but watch it, watch it. I said watch it. Say, I will watch it. Sisters, say, I will watch it. Sisters, they are not in the house. You must watch it. Look at this. It says, make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, thou shalt not go. I can see some sisters smiling there. I'm going to read for the angry woman now. Because, you know, the Bible talks about angry man and also angry woman. We're looking at chapter 21, verse 19. Chapter 21 of Proverbs, verse 19. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Brothers, watch it. Say, I will watch it. Now, everybody, brothers and sisters, I will watch. God will deliver us in Jesus' name. In fact, you know, let me read to you from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger rested in the bosom of wise people, of fools, of fools. That's why we come to the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and all wrath and all anger and all clamor and all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. I pray God will keep us free in Jesus' name. Let's come back to Acts of the Apostles chapter, Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, I'm reading now from verse 18. They were angry, and it was because of jealousy, it was because of envy, and because of that jealousy and envy, look at what they did. It says in Acts chapter 5, and in verse 18, and they laid hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. And they, but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. When they try to imprison them, nobody can imprison you. They try to confine them. There's no confinement that will hold you in Jesus' name. And when they did that, then the angel of the Lord came by night and opened the prison doors. All our doors are opened in Jesus' name. All those chains and all those shackles and all those fetters and all those talks and everything that the devil is trying to do so that just to confine you, stay in one place, confine you, be, just remain there and remain there in an unproductive ministry. I pray that all those prison doors by the mighty power of God will be opened and broken through in Jesus' name. We will we'll come forth. I said we will come forth. And then everything the Lord has appointed for us to do, we're going to do without any hindrance in Jesus' name. It goes on to verse 21. It says, And they, and when they had this, when they had that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison and to have them brought. They sent to the prison looking for you but you are not there anymore and then it goes on to say and when the officers came and found them not in the prison they returned and told saying that the prison truly found we short with all city and the keeper standing without before the doors but when we had opened we found no man within I am not there I said I am not there we are delivered in Jesus name now when the high priest and the captain of the of the temple and the chief priest had these things they doubted of 
them whereunto this would grow. Then one came and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. And when the captain of the officers uh, sent and then brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And then it says, And when they brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest are saying, did not we strictly charge you, command you that he should not teach in this name? Behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Will fill every city in this nation, every city, every village, every town in this continent with the word of God in Jesus' name. And so we find about uh, these apostles and believers that even though they were in prison, the Lord released them. Angels came and released them. Angels are still at work today. And those angels, when you need them, they'll come in Jesus' name. Over the weekend, we were, you know, at um, a Deeper Life a Conference Center. You had the testimony of that a young lady that said, uh, you know, they, they kidnapped her, two hefty men, uh, took her uh, to a place she didn't know. And then when she got there, she was calling the name of Jesus. That name is mighty. That name is powerful. And no evil power can stand before that name till this very day. That name will deliver us in Jesus' name. They said, shut up. Don't mention the name of Jesus. Do you think that Jesus can come and deliver? And then the moment, she, you know, when they said, they shut up, she shouted the more, Jesus. Everybody said, Jesus. Jesus. And then two angels came in. You know, they looked like men. And then they opened the door, got out of that place. And then she got back home. And now from the top of the head to the tip of the toe, she's well. Everything is all right. Just like for you, everything will be all right for you in Jesus' name. Look at this, the ministry of angels. Let's look at uh, Psalm 34. I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 34, and we're looking at verse 7. Psalm 34, we're reading here from verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. I'm going to read it for you now. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about you because you fear the Lord and he will deliver you and he will deliver your wife. Deliver your husband. As I just said, don't have wives, they are not saying amen. amen. And they will deliver your children in Jesus' name. Amen. Because the ministry of angels still continues today. And ours is the privilege now that God has said we will not lose, we will not lack, we will not be limited in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now decisive dedication to soul winning. Now, already they accused these uh, uh, people of God. They said, You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And then look at uh, what uh, Peter said, and this is what we say. I said, This is what we say. He was saved and we are saved. He was sanctified. We are sanctified. He was filled with the Holy Ghost and we are filled with the Holy Ghost. He was commissioned and we are commissioned. He believed in Jesus. We believe in Jesus. He had heaven as his goal. We have heaven as our goal. He had the Bible. We have the Bible. Everything he had, we had. And whatever he said, that's what we're saying to you. Look at this in verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostle answered and said, We ought to be God rather than men. That's what I say today. We ought to obey God rather than men. That's what we are saying today. We ought to obey God rather than men. The Sanhedrin will not silence you. Traditionalists will not silence you. Idol worshippers will not silence you. All those neighbors around that they don't like the gospel, they don't like the great things happening in your life, they will not silence you in Jesus' name. The people who are, who are enemies of righteousness, enemies of uh, progress, enemies of signs and wonders, they will not silence you in Jesus' name. You know, as uh, we were coming, we're going again in June, 29th of June and 30th of June, 2013. And then you are packing your load, you put your Bible there, your songbook is there, everything is there. Then you are calling, you, let us go. They say, where are you going again? Where you? I'm going to that place. And you know, once you say you are going to that place, it's a place of miracle and a place of power and the place of mountains moving and they say why don't you you went the other time when the, why don't you wait now they will not silence you and they will not hold you down in jesus name and then somebody might say if you count me as your father if you count me as a mother i'm telling you you must not go ah you say i passed that one we must obey god rather than men 
or is a teacher somewhere that you think you must not go. I say, I command you, say, you hold your command. This one I am going. I say, this one I'm going. You're coming to a church like this, and there's some one persecutor somewhere saying, if you go again, you say, I'm going again. On Monday, I am there. On Thursday, I am there. On Sunday, you'll find me there. Because that is the place, is the gate of heaven where we're learning how to get to heaven. I'm going to be there. Nothing will stop me in Jesus' name. Nothing will stop you. I said nothing will stop you. Look at your verse. Look at your verse. Look at your verse. Verse 29. And Peter, if I knew your name, I'll put your name there. And the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. That's what they said. They shouldn't say. They said it again. We'll say it again. Yeah. Whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior to give and for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins and we are his witnesses of these things and so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him when they had that they were caught to the heart and they took counsel to slay them they took counsel to slay them they plotted we're going to kill them nobody can kill you before your time you will not die another person's death. You are serving the Lord. Your life is protected in Jesus' name. Then stood up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, and a reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said, Ye men of Israel, take it yourselves, what ye intend to do as touching these men. God will raise up people that will defend you. He will raise up people that will protect you. That all the plots and all the plans they are having, that they are going to get rid read of you they cannot do it they will not do it in jesus name how about all those prophecies the lord has said spoken concerning you they still must be fulfilled how about all the promises the lord has given you they still must be fulfilled how about all the things the lord has appointed and assigned that you are going to do they must be fulfilled because nobody will take your place nobody will do your work that thing the lord has appointed for you to do you will do it in jesus name Already he told them, he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And they were still in Jerusalem. They were still to go to Judea. Nobody can kill them before getting to Judea. And then to Samaria, they were not there yet. This is still chapter 5. Nobody will kill them before getting to Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Peter was still to go to Cornelius as he was not there yet. Nobody can kill him now. And he was still to do all those miraculous things. And he has not done them. Everything the Lord appointed you will do, you will do. You will accomplish in Jesus' name. So all the people that are ganged will kill them now. Kill them now. There's a Gamaliel there. He will stop them in Jesus' name. And so that's why he said, Take heed, ye men of Israel. Take heed to yourselves. What ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days they went to their history. Rose up, Tadios. And then he says, posting himself to be somebody and to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who were slain. And all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to north. And then he said, after this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you refrain from these men and the lord is saying to all the demons refrain from this man refrain from this woman he's saying to all your enemies and all your persecutors don't touch this man he's my servant don't touch that woman he's my daughter and they will not touch you in jesus name god raised up a gamaliel there and he said refrain from these men let them alone let them alone let them alone they will leave you alone in jesus name for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will die a natural death, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Anybody that fights against the purpose of God in your life is fighting against God. And they cannot succeed. 
Then it says, and unto him they all they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them and commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, they let them go. They let you go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing, rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name and daily in the temple. That thing they said they should not do, and daily in the temple. Don't preach again, and daily in the temple. Don't teach again, and daily in the temple. Don't witness to anybody, and daily in the temple. Don't serve the Lord, and daily in the temple. Don't mention the name of Jesus, and daily in the temple. That thing Satan says you will not do, you will do. That thing persecutor said you will not do, you will do. That thing the opposers and the enemy said don't do, that's what you will do. When Satan says do this, uh -uh, I don't obey Satan, I will not do that. That thing, when Satan says jump uh, from the top and jump down, that one I will not do. But when Jesus said this is what you do, and then Satan comes, his enemies, uh, emissaries come, and his messengers come, and all those uh, enemies of righteousness, they come, they say, don't. I say, it's too late. I have a commandment from the Lord already, and I'm going to do it. I said I'm going to do it. Am I talking about you? We'll do it in Jesus' name. And daily in the temple and in every house, every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. That's where we are. The Lord has given us the commission. And because this is the commission of the Lord, we're going to do it and we're going to succeed at it in Jesus' name. Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 4. And he said unto me, son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak my words unto them. For thou art not saying to a people of a strange speech or of a hard language but to the house of Israel and not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language whose words thou canst not understand surely had I sent thee to them they would have hearkened unto thee but the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee for they will not hearken unto me for all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted behold I have made thy face strong against their faces i thought you'll say amen yeah. and thy forehead strong against their foreheads yeah. as an adamant harder than fleet have i made thy forehead fear them not neither be dismayed at their looks though they be a rebellious house the lord has sent us and what he has sent us to do we're going to do it in jesus name and then he tells us in Luke, look at Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, there's no fear in your heart because you know that the almighty, the everlasting one, the mighty one, he is with you, is by your side, you will not fail in Jesus name. He tells us in Luke chapter 12 verse 4, it says, and I say unto you my friends, fear not, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that they have no more that they can do, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear fear him which after he has killed has power to cast into hell yea i say unto you fear him we cannot fear man because what is man when god says stop they stop when he says stop breathing they stop breathing and then they are gone we find them no more and because the lord has sent us and look at the promise he has given us verses six and seven and not five sparrows sold for two farthings and not one of them is forgotten before god but even your very ear the very ears of your head are all numbered fear not therefore ye are more valued than many sparrows give me a good amen what the Lord has sent us to do, we will do. And nothing will hinder us. Nothing will stop us. In Romans chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Romans chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at home also. I am ready to preach. Say that. I am ready to preach. I said I'm ready to preach. In your community, you are ready to preach. In your school, you are ready to preach. On your campus, you are ready to preach. Anywhere you go, you are ready to preach. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew force, and also to the Greek. 
We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here is the commission of the Lord for us. He tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading here from verse 1. Here it says, I charge thee therefore before God. Don't let Pharisees stop this great commission. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season when people support you, and out of season when people don't support you. Reprove, rebuke, exhort without long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they, is referring to the Pharisees, Sadducees, traditionalists, religious people, when they, the backsliders, the scoffers, the scorners, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own laws shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of who? Of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. That's what the Lord has told us to do, and we're going to do it in Jesus' name. Uh, as we bring everything to a conclusion, come back to this, Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And daily in the temple, daily in the temple, and in every house, mark that word, in every house, they looked at their communities and they made sure they knocked at every door. They opened every door. They preached to everybody there. Why? Because of what Jesus had said. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every creature. So they went from house to house to house and that's what we are to do. Tracks are there, disabled tracks in every house. All these handbills are there of this uh, coming celebration and great revival in June. Get to every house in your community and distribute. And then you have their phone numbers. Contact everyone and you can text them. Everyone, every, every, every creature, every house, every community, and every locality, every village, and every city. We must get to them. Because that is what the Lord has told us to do. Look at it in chapter 8 and verse 4. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Therefore, the day that was scattered abroad went, tell me, everywhere, 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 preaching the word. They did it, we're going to do it. They succeeded, we're going to succeed. The, the, the revival remain. This revival is going to remain in Jesus' name. And then as you do it, angels will assist you. Angels will surround you, and the power of darkness will be forgotten and broken, destroyed in your areas in Jesus' name. Any prison, any confinement, the Lord will send those angels there. They will open all your prisons in Jesus' name. Even this night, all the confinement in your life, they are broken down in Jesus' name. Anything tying you down not to run and not to go where God wants you to go, all those in the name of Jesus, I pronounce upon your life, they are destroyed in Jesus' name. Rise up and receive the blessing of God upon your life. He has called us. We're not going to look back. He has called us. We're not going to relate. He has called us. We're not going to give in to, you know, all those people. They want us to be quiet and they want to silence us. Don't do this again. Don't mention the name of Jesus again. Mention that name. Mention that name. Mention that name. And you tell everybody in your community, his name is Jesus. He is our savior. He is our healer. He is our deliverer. He is our redeemer. He is a coming king. Let them know there is no other way it's only jesus there's no other way to salvation there's no other way to eternal life there's no other way to happiness there's no other way to joy there's no other way to hope hope eternal there's no other way to eternal satisfaction and bliss and pleasure and enjoyment only the name of jesus he is the way he is the truth he is the life he didn't we command you not to speak in this name behold you have filled jerusalem with your doctrine do it all over again and feel your community with this doctrine of the Lord Jesus, with the name of the Lord Jesus, and let nothing silence you. Let nobody silence you. And remember, if you have told lies or you've done anything that you shouldn't have done, the blood of Jesus is flowing, and the mercy of God is flowing, the love of God is flowing, and the salvation of the Lord is available. He says, Come, I love you, I don't want you to perish. And you, you get into that blood of the Lamb, He'll place you, He'll purge you. Your sins will be pardon and you will know by the grace of God I am standing in the kingdom of God and then now that you are forgiven now that you have salvation now that you have the joy of the Lord and the victory of the Lord 
Go forth and mention the name of Jesus. Go forth and preach the name of Jesus. Go forth and don't allow any persecutor, any opposer, any enemy to silence you. Go forth and succeed in this work of the Lord in Jesus' name. Tell the Lord I will. Tell the Lord I will. Tell the Lord I will. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. And the Lord will raise up angels that will protect you in the day and in the night. And the Lord will raise up people, Gamaliels, in their committee, in their council, among the Sanhedrin. They will support you, even people you don't know. God will put them there to say, don't touch that man, don't touch that woman. Don't touch them. They are my servants. And this work of the Lord will prosper in your hand. And all your chains and shackles, everything totally will be destroyed. The Lord has had mercy on you. Show that mercy to other people. Reveal that mercy to other people. Reveal that mercy to other people. Say, Lord, I will. Rather obey God than men. Rather obey God than men. We must obey God. We must obey God rather than men. Persecution will not stop me. Opposition will not stop me. And remember, anger should be in the world, not in the church. In the council that has anger. In Sanhedrin that has anger. Sadducees that have anger, indignation, wrath, bitterness. Anger rests in the bosom of fools. You're not a fool, you're a child of God. Joy, not anger. Peace, not anger. Appreciation of that which is good, not anger. Rejoicing. When God is working miracle in the lives of other people, not anger. Say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. Take all anger, bitterness, wrath, indignation away from me. Envy away from me. Jealousy away from me. Be on the side of the people of God, on the side of this great revival. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength.